right brain, uh, left brain thing as um, like perhaps the, the left brain is more of the, um, the conscious and the right brain is more the unconscious. And I just wondered, is there anything in the literature that talks about that? Um, well, yeah, I think there's a lot in, um, uh, in neurobiology that's, uh, I mean, um, uh, neuro neuropsychology these days, they're talking about that. But um, I brought Jim Grotstein's latest books. He talks about this quite a lot. And this, this is, these are at, but, but at the same time on another level, it's two volumes worth of work. He's prolific, um, but he he talks about that and he references the work of the the neuropsychology field that's just bursting forth <laughs> these days. Um, and he, he also talks about how I guess they've figured out that also um, you know Freud used the couch originally just because he couldn't stand people looking at him all day. He couldn't think with people looking at him and he didn't really feel like looking at people all the time. But um, what they realized just, you know, sort of in neurobiology is that um, being in a prone position activates the right brain um, being in that position so people are more in a state of reverie. And I guess they've sort of traced it also where it's also the state um, that the nursing mother and infant are in. I think it's the um, increase in theta waves. Mm -hmm. I, I think they sort of uh, linked that up. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about resistance. I mean, you said something about when you when you mention the truth to a client that they don't know whether it's the truth or not, but you know, they might not be ready to hear. So going back to your example of the whole passive aggressive thing, you might say something to a client, they might look at you and go like, yeah, no, that's not it. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, why would you say that? You know, they, they would turn against you. And at that point, either you challenge the resistance or you empathize with the part of the patient that got disappointed in you. I was just wondering if you could just speak of how you work around that mm -hmm. and how, how you make that choice mm -hmm. between challenging the defense or... Uh -huh. Well, you know, I... Um, if I have a feeling that, let's just say, um, uh, with, a, with a passive aggressive uh, patient that she's really talking about that part of herself, I have to find a way that I can bring that in that I think the patient can manage um, in Jim's uh, Book. He, he's, I love his language sometimes. He speaks about it that we have to give the patient a dosage of sorrow, mm -hmm. like the dose that they can bear. And um, the, so, uh, you know, I, I will try and speak to the patient about, you know, it sounds like this woman is really having a hard time saying it directly. And she doesn't quite know how to deal with her anger, and she's doing it in all these ways that are just pissing people off, and people are walking off the job, and all the rest of it. And it's really annoying, I get it. And, you know, I can kind of understand, though, that she's frightened about that. And I don't remember when we talked about that time, you know? So I'll reference something that, that's happened between us. And I guess maybe that's what was going on there. You know, remember when we talked about how frightened you were that if you said that, when you were really pissed off at me directly, that I'd like kick you out or something. And so, so, I tr so that's the first thing. It's like how we, how we speak to the patient about it. Sometimes, but I'll say something that I think is going on, and the patient will say, like, you were, like, missed, missed the mark that time. Well, I never know if I have or if I haven't. All I have is my 
best guess at the moment. That's what I think our interpretations are. It's really our best guess at the moment. But it's always open to adjustment or change from the patient because they're the one who knows. And so, you know, it depends, like sometimes if a patient really goes to town with how, how badly I've missed the mark, if I have a good enough bond, I can play with that. And I might say something like, okay, but doth I protest too much? And you know, so we can have a good laugh about that. Well, maybe, I don't know. Well, just wondering, you know. Or if the patient just flat out to us and say, okay, that's fine. That's just kind of what I thought, but maybe I got it wrong. But when I say that the patient knows the truth, even while they're protesting, if you, if you did hit the nail on the head, who knows, we never know if we really did, but if we did, patient knows it, mm -hmm. whether they ever admit it to you or not. I had a patient once who wanted me to do something that I wouldn't do, and um, I said if she was going to do this thing, I don't want to go into details, but I said, you know, I would end the treatment which was a little drastic, but I didn't know what else to do. So it was a pretty drastic thing that this patient wanted to do. And um, she, I was seeing her twice a week at the time. For two years, she berated me that I would do that to her, that what a horrible thing I would do. Oh, I was just like the worst person. But shortly after that, she started coming five times a week. It took about two years until she was able to say, that was the moment that I trusted you. So, you see what I'm saying about, she knew that I said something else, because what she wanted to do was not, was, not, was very self-destructive. And um, it would have been out of, and I said, I, you know, I can't, if you do this, I can't protect you. And if I can't protect you, we don't have a treatment, basically. So um, she knew that I had done the very thing, which has, and she told me this later. Um, I knew that you would always take good care of me mm -hmm. when you do that, because you were willing to set a boundary. But was she going to let me know that? You have no idea what I had to live through mm -hmm. until she could finally bear mm -hmm. to tell me that. So that's what I meant by it's okay. I mean, I'm like, fine. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. But you just let it go. Mm -hmm. And if it's right, the patient will bring it back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you so <coughs> thank you so much for your talk. I really appreciated it. And um, there, are, I, and I appreciate you're talking about the importance of the container and how fragile some people become, like in the treatment with you, or fragile and regrets, and that you have an important role there in being with them. And that makes me wonder, like coming from the community mental health, mm -hmm. is it possible to do this type of work in non-traditional settings? Like, could you do this work at a high school or like in a public clinic, mm -hmm. somewhere where there's not such a Solid container. Yeah, I actually think that's a that's a wonderful question, and I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, and that goes back to my point that I do think um, psychoanalysis is a way of being. It's it's how we again how we see the world, how we see human beings, how we understand relationship. It's it you know, and once we hold that, it's then how we relate to someone. So I think, absolutely, it might not look like somebody on the couch in a consultation room in a sort of traditional psycho psychoanalysis, but I certainly think we can think about people's issues in a psychoanalytic way. I think we can use, you know, um, Beyond's uh, work on, you know, metabolizing 
the chaos in their lives and giving it back to whether that's a student or a patient in the community mental health or a drop-in clinic, that you know, we can uh, metabolize their catastrophe, whatever that is, and give it back to them in a form that would feel that they were understood and that they felt held and contained. So um, I think we can relate psychoanalytically in many aspects of our lives. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for the talk. Kim Crossballer goes survey is probably well known or not, but that almost like half of therapists felt, people that are practicing therapists felt that in their own therapy that had been done to them, at least half of them felt they'd been badly injured by a bad therapeutic interaction at some point. Mm -hmm. And it was shocking to me that that would be as high as that. But I'm, I'm particularly wondering about the narrow set of things where someone gets in a tangle with the therapist, maybe feels like the therapist isn't treating them well enough or helpfully or something like that. And maybe it is partly the client, but it might also be partly the therapist. I wonder what you've seen if that doesn't get sorted out, what the impacts are that the clients carry forward. Yeah, well, that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. So you're really speaking to the negative therapeutic reaction. And I don't, but not just that. Well, especially not, not primed just with a transplant. It just seems like me? it's primed with a transference from the patient. It just seems like it's so larger than life that I really wonder what the impacts, you know, from a psychoanalytic point of view rather than a non transfers we were earlier bumped, they're bumped out and we'll have to go see something else. I'm wondering when the transfers goes through that or it does. Well, um, you know, uh, there's a person, I don't know if any of you have heard about her, Sue Elkind, um, has worked a lot with um, therapeutic impasse mm -hmm. when those things happen. And um, her, she has a lot to say about it. She's written a book on it, but her basic premise is that she feels like two people, the, the, the patient and the animal's vulnerabilities uh, sort of crashed, mm -hmm. came up against each other and crashed. And for whatever reason, whether it was on work material in the animal's, so that he or she was not able to contain the intensity of the transference that was happening. Um, and, you know, uh, these can be very damaging experiences, in particular if the analyst holds, or any therapist holds the position that it's the patient's fault. Mm -hmm. If there's a blaming of the patient in any way, then it's 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 very it can be very very damaging, and um, and many people have been, uh, as you said. I'm assuming this comes from your own research. Is that what you're speaking? Yeah, this little you're piece of it, I've heard of this too all kind also, and I was surprised how almost everyone said, "Oh, there is someone looking at that." And like out of a whole profession, that there'd be one person mm -hmm. only looking at it, striking mm -hmm. it. You know, that it's not an industry of itself, mm -hmm. but there's one consultant for yeah. the whole nation. So. Well, I mean, uh, I don't know if there's anyone else, but that, that is actually very interesting. But I think it is, it's very much uh, paid attention to in um, contemporary psychoanalysis because it, that, that's the, sort of the premise of the two-person psychology, the move from the one-person psychology than the two-person psychology. So the one-person psychology is just, just the patient in the room. Well, I mean, that's a little confusing because what's the bottom line is, and I can get a little fussy about how people interpret relational schools, so I, I don't have time for that. But at any rate, um, yes, there's one person in the room, and the person to be helped is the patient. That is the focus. And, and anything that happens, it's for the patient. But there are two psyches in the room. There are two unconsciouses in the room. And, you know, especially in a very deep, very regressed, very primitive transference, there's going to be some material in the analyst that's going to get stirred and triggered. 
And um, that's when we need to get a lot of consultation. We need to be held ourselves in the treatment as we try and help somebody get through this. So sometimes it's a, it's, you know, the, the, I don't know what the fault, but the, the deficit is in the analyst's inability to just hold something for that analyst's own personal reason. And other times I think it can be an enactment. If a patient's transference is about a mother or a parental figure that really dropped the child, really, really abandoned the child in some way, that might get reenacted that it's so solidified that there is nothing but abandonment allowed in the transference and counter-transference. And that can be very, very hard to work through if the patient is at that phase. So sometimes, you know, patients have to go through a number of treatments until they're ready to actually work something through. Sometimes the trauma has to, is just has to be enacted. And it just happened to get enacted in that particular analytic dyad. I've never heard that before. It was fascinating. What the factor that I have to take into account? Yeah, yeah. and I, I think that's that's you know that's hard to, to I think for because as therapists we want to cure, we want to be helpful, and sometimes. Um, we can't always be, and I think the best we can do is recognize that. Yes. Um, One more question. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, what are your thoughts on inter excuse me, interpreting um, the transference or an enactment? Can you talk a little bit about that? About interpreting it when it's happening yeah. in the room? Yeah, right. Um, well, I think, it, um, I think it has to be talked about. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, um, <coughs> well, I'll just give you a, a, like a really, really brief example. Um, I worked with a patient once where I felt like I was a, I felt myself to be a very bad analyst because mm -hmm. I was interrupting the patient all the time. Mm -hmm. I just talked a lot, you know? I thought, mm -hmm. what is wrong with me? You know, like, <laughs> I'd be like pinching myself, like, shut up, for God's mm -hmm. sake, you know? I'm just talking away, you know? And, um, at, and the patient, you know, over time was able to let me know about this a mother who was always interrupting her. And at one point I had said to her, oh my God, but why haven't you ever told me to shut up? Because that's what, but what are we doing here? We're repeating the same thing. I am always interrupting you. And so but that, that was also part of, you know, the, the, by, by stating that, it gave her, it opened up the space and gave her permission to then, oh, I can talk about those things. I did feel it, but what you always say is really helpful, so I didn't really want you to stop talking. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, but I was behaving, you know, so I was behaving in an unusual way, and I was being, this is the unconscious cue mm -hmm. from the patient to enact something. So once it came into consciousness, then we could talk about it, and that opened up the space for her to know that, oh, I can talk to you about things that happen in this room between us, if they feel good or don't feel good. Mm -hmm. So that's how we yeah. So that's a common thing that people will, I mean, you find yourself talking, and you never, that's nothing you've ever even done before. You just you're you got the you're unconscious. It was got unconscious. The it was like it was reading its cue cards. <laughs> Interrupt. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah, and that's common. That like and you said the earlier one, the person was really abandoned by their mom early on, and then they needed to enact this 
issue with their analyst. Mm -hmm. And then you said, and then maybe it has to end, and then they have to pick up another mm -hmm. one because it's so. Well, I do want to say something about that because you know it is part of it is in some way we have to know what our script is, and sometimes our script is to be the one who has dropped and abandoned the patient, mm -hmm. and that we have to give the space the patient the space to feel it for the first time. Some of the very early, um, you know, infantile experiences, they have to be lived through for the first time in the room. The pain, the, um, the trauma, the devastation of it. Well, how can a patient feel that and live that with a analyst who's helpful and holding and loving. Mm. Well, that's not going to work, mm -hmm. is it? Mm. I can, you can't deal with my trauma because mine is being abandoned by a narcissistic parent. So you need to play a narcissistic analyst who's completely self-involved and to, to completely abandons me so that I can feel the pain for the very first time. I can live it. The, the depth of the trauma sometimes can only be felt that way. And so, that I think addresses your question. Yeah, there reminds me of the Annie Rogers book, A Shining Affliction. Have you read it? I haven't. Oh, it's basically this, for her first therapist, really in action, acts the mother role, the abandoning mother role, and she has a psychotic break over it, and then goes to see the, another analyst afterward. And, this other analyst really puts everything back together for <laughs> Well, we do have to end here, unfortunately. But thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you.